Welcome back to DXB Today on the occasion of day one of the World Government Summit. And we've given you uh, just a few of the highlights of what's been going on down now. Now we're breaking down uh, the real matters right here in studio. And joining us now in studio, our next guest is a sustainability leader driving innovative solutions for a transformative future, bringing her expertise on sustainability uh, and net zero transition strategies uh, on an international scale to the UAE, to the region and the world as a whole. Head of Sustainability at JLL, an absolute pleasure to welcome Elida Salah to the, sta to the stage. Well, it is a stage, I suppose, isn't it? <laughs> the sofa is, is more comfortable. Pleasure welcoming. to be here. Great to have you here, um, especially during such a busy time of the year and a busy couple of days for you as well. Your reactions first and foremost to the World Government Summit, the bringing together of so many influential minds for a topic that is so close to your heart. I think it's about time that the world really starts to prioritize sustainability. It's been on the agenda, but it's always been on the back burner. I've been championing this uh, endeavor for over 20 years now and I feel like it's finally got the front and center stage. And it's because it's so critical. It, it really is linked to our lives and our livelihoods. It's, the, it's about the planet. And so, and while, while we say all of this, we can actually make a lot of money doing it. And, and, and you bring up such a key point there. Yeah. You know, a lot of people have looked at, to my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, and obviously JLL and your organization, your team speak to organizations yeah. the world over. A lot of people I speak to just get, well, it's going to cost us money, isn't it? You know, it's going to cost us a lot of money, and, we're not, and, and we just don't have that in the budget, especially if I'm a little startup rather than the big international. And yet, as you say, that, that opportunity from sustainability is something is a point that needs to be reiterated. Absolutely, and, and nobody really associates climate risk is financial risk. And so when you look at how you want to look at your portfolio, so if I look at a real estate development and I look at it from how am I going to ensure that my assets are going to appreciate in value over a period of time, it's about how what valuations I'm going to look at. And what am I what am I prioritizing? And when I start prioritizing things like climate risk becoming real for my assets, you're going to start experiencing brown discounts. So banks are becoming a lot more stringent when they're lending money. Investors are starting to really change their preferences of what types of assets they're willing to invest in. Consumer preferences are changing. If you look at millenniums and Gen Zs, they're continuously changing their preferences and then one of their major drivers is the fact that they really want environmental issues right up front and, and to top it all off, you actually save money living in a green building. So Ada, you did mention construction and real estate. How is that translating into the actual market uh, when it comes to sustainability? So if you start to see the market drivers are really changing, as I'd mentioned earlier, investors are starting to demand it, but we're also starting to see governments are taking a real action plan and how we're gonna mitigate climate change. So if you look globally, over 140 countries have committed to net zero pledges. Um, pledges or commitments, which is which attributes to almost 80% of global greenhouse gases. That translates into business opportunity, it also translates into urgency. And so when you start to see that type of a shift, um, you can start seeing market dynamics changing. We'll see some countries that are leading the way like Europe, um, and we see emerging economies like the UAE starting really to take action plans and really start to put those stringent re rules and regulations in place to help curb the impacts of climate change. Alida, I wanted to ask you something, just to make it easier also for everyone at home to understand what we're talking about. What is the impact of the built environment in respect, for example, to CO2 emissions? The built environment attributes almost 20% to greenhouse, global greenhouse gas emissions and almost 40% to global greenhouse energy related em emissions. So you can see the impacts are huge and it attributes to a third of the global waste that's generated. So the impacts are huge. We need to start doing things more efficiently, more effectively, and we have the tools and capabilities now to start looking at it. Of course, we know that the supply chain has to evolve. Um, we're, on that, we're on that journey together, but it's where people can come together and collaborate and, and sort of if basically um, leapfrog the change, right? You need to start collaborating, and I think we never really emphasize that enough, and it's about bringing civil society together, it's about bringing governments together, it's about bringing the built environment, it's about bringing individuals together to take action, because it's not up to only governments to bring about change, it's about each one of us doing what we need to do. 
And like you said, we, we touched on something that, is there a difference between how the UAE is uh, doing the changes to the region and globally, like in different countries, regarding to sustainability? Yeah, so the UAE has really, I would say, like uh, COP28 has just taken UAE to a different level. Yeah. And, you know, we have leadership here who really puts, walks the talk. And what we're starting to see is that there's action being taken. So I'll give you an example. At um, COP28, we had the first movers coalition announced by Her Excellency Razan al Mubarak, which brought together some of the biggest developers across the region together to talk about what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, what type of legislations do we need, do we need green financing, what are the roadblocks, and currently we're in collaboration with them and that continues to be a working group that works together to bring about change. So that just is a small example of the types of work that's happening within the UAE and I'm hoping that we can take this and scale this globally. Yeah. I'm so glad that you've used the phrase walk in the talk and talk in the walk at the moment as well because that's that's one thing that I think I've seen on day one of WGS and hopefully we'll see over the next three days. And again, it's that momentum that carries yeah. on from COP28. A question for you both though, up to the naysayers out there because I think COP28 silenced a lot of people when it came to seeing action, mm -hmm. you know, so we're certainly seeing the progress, etc. But there are still those out there that I hear on a daily basis saying, what's the point? Because um, a new government will come in in a country and policy changes and therefore we have to go back to the, 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 the start, back to block, uh, step one as well. How do we address that? I think it, we have to go back to awareness and education about what climate change really is and the impact it has at different levels. Sometimes, and maybe in the past, uh, it was too much related to government and not enough to people. I think what happened at this COP, it was also a very big focus on the impact on people, livelihood, not having access to water, not having access to food. This is climate change. Mm -hmm. People having to move and become migrants because they don't have a home or the place where they are is not fit anymore to leave. So when people learn about this, that's where they understand there is something we need to do about it. But then at the same time, we need to do we need to work on what's possible because otherwise the other problem is we create panic or we create anxiety or depression and that's where people don't take action. Mm -hmm. So in order for people after being aware to take action is to show what's possible. So when you see at COP all the different uh, actions that have happened at private sector level, government, government level, but also the community coming together and all the uh, uh, so, um, NGOs and, and, and smaller groups, this is real yeah. and it's tangible. Alida, would you concur? I would absolutely concur. You know, it's, it is about people just taking the first step and breaking it down into actionable pieces. I think climate change is such a complex topic that we need it's to think huge, about what, it, what, what, what's, what is it, what is, how am I impacted? How are you impacted? What does it mean for the world? So we need to take it step by step. So I'll take it to an organization level. I hear from a lot of my clients, like, how am I gonna get started? It's gonna cost me too much. Um, and, and you kind of start with, what, what have, where are you at today? Because you cannot reduce your carbon footprint of your organization to become better unless you know where you start. Mm -hmm. So it's about starting, taking those small actions, and then getting everybody in the organization up and down the ladder really committed to it. And you would see the amazing um, momentum that happens in an organization. The culture transforms, leadership, um, you know, you find that people, because culture transform leadership's happier because people are more productive, but if you actually live in nice, healthy buildings, you actually start to see productivity improves, but you want to be there, right? You want to be a part of that change, and, and that's one of the reasons why I'm at JLL, right? We have committed to our own net zero journey for 2040, and so as talent becomes premium, being able to attract talent and, and committing to causes that are important globally really makes a difference. Please stay with us. Lane, what you got for us next? Yes, Tom. Well, I went down to Dubai's Museum of the Future for the Times 100 Impact Awards to meet the change makers shaping the realms of their industries. Check it out. Good evening, everyone. Here we are at the Museum of the Future for the Time 100 AI Awards. What an honor it is to be here because we're meeting some of the most influential people in the world when it comes to tech and the development of AI. Yes, we are gonna be seeing them. We're gonna be honoring them here at this award ceremony and 
It's actually my first time here, so I'm really excited to speak to them and to see the place, which is one of the icons of Dubai. You've been in this uh, industry, in this realm for so many years. As I said before, you, you've achieved so much. How does it feel now to actually see the progression and, and where do you see it going? Well, so it, it, what's very surprising is that the progress was was not continuous. Uh, there was a lot of things that we were super excited about in the mid 80s, and they started having an impact in the 90s. And then by the mid 90s, everybody sort of abandoned the whole field of what we now call deep learning. Uh, and that kind of nothing nothing was happening much in for about 10 years, and then it kind of got revived, and then exploded in about 10 years ago and now it's you know on everybody's mind and it's it's mind-boggling what are you most looking forward to tonight and um, how do you feel being at this such a big event i'm looking forward to exchanging thoughts and observations with some of the most intelligent people in the world i believe you know our media doesn't always focus on those things it entertains, it doesn't always enlighten or educate. And uh, I'm excited about the minds that we're honoring. And how much uh, time have you actually spent in Dubai? Well, it's been almost four years now. Um, and uh, enjoying everything of it. Uh, I think it's moving, it's, bo it's booming, a lot of innovation, uh, a lot of different cultures mixing up and, uh, and um, for example, in my, my activity in sports, so many great things to do to achieve and for me a great way to transfer my experience. And then the same day you could be working with kids and be here at the Museum of the Future, uh, speaking about the future, celebrating innovation, art. So that's what it's all about in Dubai. So tell me a little bit more about InstaDeep. What was the inspiration to actually have something so incredibly needed for people? Well, it was really the, uh, the feeling I had that talent in the developing world was not uh, used at its max potential and there was the chance to change perceptions. For example, when you think about deep tech and innovation and AI, you think automatically about the US, Europe or China. You don't think about Africa or the developing world. So I just wanted to change that and it was kind of a fun adventure. And there you have it, meeting some of the most influential people in the world when it comes to the tech and AI sphere. Keep watching this space because big things are happening and keep watching DXB today. Hey, up our lane there, rubbing shoulders with the good and the great down at the Museum of the Future. <laughs> Miracle we got him back in studio tonight, that's for sure. Anyway, uh, it is that time of the evening. It's time for today's Roundup. Ahmed, what have you got for us? I have got the daily Roundup, as you know. Um, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the Prime Minister and ruler of Dubai, recently set a wide-reaching plans to combat bureaucracy and boost efficiency by boosting customer satisfaction in government services across the Emirates. He announced motivational bonuses of up to 1 million dirhams for the employees or the working team that excels in reducing and eliminating unnecessary procedures. Our goal is to facilitate people's lives, provide people with the comfort and service they deserve in the UAE. Uh, and the aim is to be the best government in the world in providing services. That's what he said. I think it's a very important point is to invest in the employees. And this will just boost the eff efficiency of everybody. And I think it's just an amazing thing that they took that initiative. So what do you guys think? Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> it's a good bonuses. thing. I, th it's I think the, thing. the one thing that, that, that really props everyone up is like the bonuses, right? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? That incentive. Um, but it's not just that. I mean, it's, it's always been a customer service based place uh, when it comes to all different sectors. So, and, and I've seen the progression, being here for many, many years, I've seen the progression. I've seen people coming in and really trying to, to, to go that extra step and that extra level. 
Um, so yeah, th yeah, now now there's an incentive. <laughs> I think there's a but here though yes. as well. And, the, and, and, and you're right. I think everyone on these servers has been here for a while and they've seen the sort of progress. And you know, kudos to the government for the great initiatives they put in place. You know, Digital Dubai is brilliant. We're seeing smart stations, police, otherwise, and the services. So many more of the services are being fast tracked at the moment. However. All of us are still asked for passport copies on a fairly regular basis. All of us need to get bank statements on a fairly regular basis, etc. And, and I think this is one of these things that's addressing that, going, you know what? In order to be, because the visions are so far reaching and so high, uh, you know, forward thinking as well, that in order to get there, the efficiency needs to keep up at the moment. And this seems to be, to me, Tatiana, what that's addressing for me I mean since I've been living here it's been a working progress everything was always geared to be you know more efficient uh, but also make us happier I think this is about Dubai right uh, everyone is with a smile so already you're very welcome here now it's about making this more efficient mm. but we've seen already things that are out of the future for example when you go to the airport and now you don't even need to go to someone and show your passport yeah. you just walk by <laughs> it's like <laughs> incredible so i think it's just about making sure that these special technologies are applied all over and make really everything smooth and, mm. and easy and, and faster but uh, I'm always surprised to see what's next because it's already living in the future. You won't have to go to the airport next. No. You? <laughs> <laughs> Teleport. <laughs> your exactly. Teleportation. Lida, is this because we are time poor these days and everyone's, everyone's watching the clock all the time and so um, making things more efficient is essential? Well, I think globally, if you look at it, money is at premium, right? Yep. It's always always has been. And so the Dubai government is very efficient in the way that they want to do things. And they want to cut out all the red tape. And I think that will be one of the key drivers of change in region and, and, and one of those accelerators for the government. Because everybody now is looking at the UAE for inspiration of how they can do things better, which I love. Mm. And no big surprise to me, no coincidence that this initiative was announced just before World Go the Government Summit. It's a, a hot topic at the moment. So everyone coming in going, what, you're gonna make it more efficient than it is already? Wow. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's a great initiative. So please um, stick around. Uh, we're gonna be discussing this more. We're gonna have another super siren on just after the break. Thank you for joining us, Olida. Pleasure. Always a pleasure to see you. And coming up, we get a little bit deeper in discussing sustainability goals at the WGS with the Managing Director of Sustainability at HSBC. Stick with us. <laughs>